afternoon to everyone who has joined in for today's special session. And we have the honor of having Bante Yogavacha Rahula tuning in, joining us from Maryland, USA. And we are so honored that Bante has uh, taken up our invitation, uh, invitation and agreed to talk on both his experiences with Bhante Nyanadipa and, uh, and of course, the first part of the Satipatthana. So Bhante Yogavacha Rahula does not need an introduction, but of course, for the sake of uh, tradition, I will introduce Bhante most humbly. Uh, Bhante Rahula has uh, been an ordained monk since 1975, Bhante Rahula received his ordination uh, in Sri Lanka. And he's now the current principal director uh, and teacher of the Lion of Wisdom Center in Maryland, USA. Bhante Rahula has been instrumental in bringing in uh, the practice of yoga into the practice or together to the practice of Theravada Buddhist meditation. And I am very excited on hearing Bhante's um, take on uh, Satipatthana and also listening to Bhante's experiences with Bhante Nyanadipa, um, who unfortunately passed away uh, in, uh, at the end of September. So it, it has been a great loss for forest monks and monks, the sasana all over the world because Venerable Yanadipa Bhante Rahula will speak more about Bhante and Yanadipa was considered um, like to be the father of forest monks really, uh, father of forest monks. So Bhante Rahula, over to you Bhante. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and I want to uh, thank Venerable uh, Panya Vamsa for inviting me to uh, share my experiences uh, both with the uh, Venerable, the late great Nyanadipa Mahathiro and, uh, and the practice of the mindfulness of the body, which is the first stage of the path to liberation. Uh, so uh, as you mentioned, I was ordained as, a, as a, actually a, no a novice monk in 1975 at Tapawani. And that was also kind of a forest monastery, but the monks there weren't really practicing what I would consider, let's say, forest tradition. Uh, and then somewhere in the first couple of years that I was uh, ordained, I heard about the Venerable Jnana Deepa, who was living at that time down in Bundala, which is a forest, uh, uh, it was a kuti actually, near a village uh, on the seacoast on the southern sea coast of Sri Lanka. And uh, a lay friend of mine had uh, driven me down there and uh, I went to uh, visit him. And normally he doesn't uh, like visitors because he was uh, very much uh, in, in seclusion. And, uh, but anyway, I, I went there to pay my respects to him. And, uh, you know, for, you know, for some reason, we, we kind of got along, and you know, he was, he, he invited me to uh, come there and uh, well to stay with him one night, and we had some discussions in the on the suttas. In my first uh, year or two, I was studying the suttas at the Tapawani, and uh, then I heard that he was also, you know, very much into the suttas, and so we had some discussions uh, with that. Uh, on the suttas, and uh, I saw the, the way that he practiced, and he was a uh, he was very much um, using mindfulness of of the body as well as the whole of Satipatthana, but the mindfulness of the body as one of his uh, you know grounding and, and primary practices, at least then at that time. So he would he would have been a monk already, probably about about uh, seven or eight years. Uh, by the time I had uh, met him. So we were still, and we, we had, you know, I be, uh, we came to Sri Lanka both in our mid twenties. And uh, we were just three years apart, I think in age, but uh, so, 
I, I was very inspired by his practice of the forest tradition because he was the first monk really and also Western monk that I met in Sri Lanka that was really a kind of living an exemplary uh, Buddhist monk life according to the suttas. He had a kuti that was not too far and not too close to a village for alms and he was going on uh, Pindapata to the Bundala village for alms. And uh, he had also been uh, an admirer and had studied the teachings of the Venerable uh, Jnana Vira, who was an English monk who was living uh, in Sri Lanka even before that. But Jnana Vira died in about 1965, I believe, but he left behind some teachings, uh, some unique teachings uh, in his take on uh, the Dhamma and the practice of you know, developing wisdom and so on. So we had that in common too, because I was also uh, studying and had heard about uh, these teachings of Jnana Vira. So anyway, uh, at the time, Jnana, uh, Jnana Deepa, he used the forest life to, in one sense, to overcome uh, uh, fear. And he was, you know, challenged by that. And he was living in a place where there were poisonous uh, snakes, but uh, he didn't let that, uh, uh, you know, scare him. In fact, the previous occupant of Bundala Kuti, an American monk named uh, Sumana, had been bitten by a poisonous uh, snake uh, just nearby the Kuti and had died because he didn't get to a quick medical treatment. But Jnana uh, Deepa did not, uh, you know, let that deter him, deter him. And I was very inspired by that. And it, it kind of inspired my own practice of uh, living out in the forest as well. And then later on uh, in years, I mean, after that initial contact, I didn't have contact with him for a long time. Uh, but uh, he had also uh, moved in any time a lot of some people found out where he was living and want to go and visit him. He would move to another place, even without telling people, he would kind of just vanish from where he was. And he uh, would find another place in the forest in different uh, parts. And he had gone up in the candy area and had been living in the deep forest there and changing kutis and places uh, whenever people found out about him. So he didn't like any disciples, he didn't want to be well known. He, he didn't give any public teachings. Really, he was he was really uh, you know following you know sort of the ideal solitude, and uh, in it, but he was always studying the suttas and he he practiced the dhamma according to uh, the suttas, and so uh, and that 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 had inspired my practice a great deal and. Uh, so I've, I've tried to follow his example as much as I could. I wasn't as successful as he was probably, but uh, anyway, uh, then about uh, 12 years ago or so, when I went back to Sri Lanka, I had the or, uh, chance of meeting him uh, again. And that's when I had written this uh, little article about him with some photos that a lot of people have uh, since seen. Uh, but uh, even though I didn't get to spend a lot of time with him in his later years, uh, you know, we kept in contact through other people. But he was an inspiration to so many uh, other monks in Sri Lanka too, and a, a lot of the, the Sri Lankan monks. And he was, uh, he was, I would say, you could say maybe the father of uh, the forest tradition in Sri Lanka, of course, in Thailand and Burma, there had been other you know, monks who were considered the father of the forest tradition, like Achan Man in Thailand and, uh, and so on. But uh, nevertheless, he was probably uh, the premier uh, ascetic, you could say, in Sri Lanka, uh, in, in, is at least amongst Western monks and uh, probably amongst uh, Sri Lankan monks as well. So, uh, you know, I wanted to share with you, uh, you know, this uh, series of talks is about uh, 
you know, the, the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, because uh, I'm sure that uh, Venerable Jnana Deepa was using the Satipatthana Sutta as his main reference for the practice of meditation. And just the, the first few words of the Satipatthana Sutta, you know, lay it all out. This is the direct way for the overcoming of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, for abolishing ignorance and for uh, cultivating wisdom that, that, that leads to enlightenment. So, you know, the direct way, you know, there may be indirect ways, but, you know, the Satipatthana Sutta is like an attack dog, you know, it attacks the problem uh, directly. And uh, so, you know, in, in the very first thing, uh, after saying that, the, Bu the Buddha says that, you know, a monk finds a suitable location to meditate and sits down and keeps the, the posture erect. You know, erect is the key. That means uh, to be able to keep the spine and the head in a straight line. And why is that? Because meditation happens between the brain and the spinal column. That's where all the senses are connected to the nervous system along the spine. And that's what relays all the sensory data to the brain where you have perception. So keeping the nervous system in an optimal uh, state of alertness is the key point. Uh, and so, but you, you see a lot of meditators where the emphasis is not so much on uh, the posture, uh, and so a lot of them, you know, have their head kind of down like this, and, and that'll lead to the slouching of the spine. And then you wind up being, uh, having a fuzzy awareness or half asleep or just lost in your thoughts. So keeping the uh, spine straight was the, really the first instruction of the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, of course, and then crossing uh, the leg. Uh, and, you know, the Satipatthana Sutra is divided into four stages, I'm sure most of you know. Mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feelings, mindfulness of the mental uh, states, and mindfulness of the Dhamma. Which, uh, which these will be covered over in uh, the, the following uh, weeks on the, by other teachers. Now, uh, the Buddha chose mindfulness of the body first. Now, why is that? You know, the Buddha didn't waste any words. And everything he said had a particular order for a particular reason. And of course, we, we all know that the, the essence of suffering or the deepest cause of suffering is within the mind. And basically is, is ignorance and the, and the craving and the desires uh, that have uh, evolved through uh, ignorance. That means not knowing the truth. But the mind is not easily to, to get a hold of. It's not easy to just immediately start watching one's mind and thoughts because uh, they're occurring at a very uh, deep level. You know, actually our thoughts are originate deep in the nervous system and the unconscious mind. And so uh, in order to be able to observe our thoughts, we have to be uh, grounded and centered in, in the body and attentive to the nervous system because that's where the, the sensory impulses are coming through. And that's what triggers off you know, the contacts with the senses and triggers off the feeling, depending on contact arises feeling. And de depending on feeling arises uh, you know, the various other uh, thoughts and perceptions. So uh, being centered and grounded in the body is, uh, you know, one of the important aspects about mindfulness of the body. Now, when most people read uh, mindfulness of the body, uh, you know, a lot of them think that, oh, it's about seeing the body as this uh, smelly, uh, dirty thing that we should, uh, you know, detach from and uh, kind of uh, disassociate with. 
Now, in one level, that may uh, there's some truth to that. That uh, you know, as a, in the various uh, later stages of mindfulness of the body, but uh, in my opinion, that's not the the most important aspect of it. But Basically, this body is what most people identify with. But anyway, first of all, the mindfulness of the, of the body uh, instructions is the mindfulness of breathing. So <clears throat> you start developing concentration on uh, developing the anapanasati. And the purpose of that is to get one centered in the body. Because normally our mind is wandering around you know, in the past and future, getting distracted in all the sensory impressions. And very rarely are we centered and relaxed in the, in the body. The, uh, but the body was the true home for the mind. The mind and the body, you could say, were born together at the moment of conception. And for nine months, all the mind could feel were these sensations of the body developing you know, in the womb from a one cell organism to a multi-billion cell organism in, in this time of just uh, nine months. So, you know, that's, that's a lot of energy going on, you know, in nine months, this body went from a, you know, invisible one cell organism to multi-billion cell organism that weighed seven or eight pounds. So, and all that was just uh, this energy of cells multiplying and uh, developing the, you know, the solid uh, features of a body. But it started just basically as a kind of a, an, an atom of energy or, you know, at the point of conception where the mother and father produced the material elements, but it was the consciousness that uh, drove the development of, of the body. So anyway, I'm just saying this to kind of set the stage that the, the, the mind was basically in the present moment, uh, you know, most of that time that it was developing in the womb, feeling this tremendous uh, energy and it totally at one with the body, right? So, and when the baby was born, the mind is still basically in the present moment. And it's just, uh, you know, having that direct connection with the body. And the body is actually also, it's always in the present moment. It's always just here. Uh, and so the body is actually the connection, our natural connection to the present uh, moment. And it's also the, the, the stepping stone to reach uh, the mind. So... Uh, those are also important aspects to understand about uh, the reason why the Buddha chose the body as the uh, starting point for the meditation. And when we say body, we, we inc that means the breathing too, because the breathing is, you know, the body. So breathing and heart beating are the two most uh, continuous and, and constant things that are always going on in the body that are, that you can easily observe. So anyway, by practicing Anapanasati, one develops initial concentration. And that helps to center uh, the mind and the body, you know, feeling the, the whole breath body. Uh, and there's some differences of opinion on what, you know, the whole breath body means, but also uh, contemplating the body in the body. And the way I take on it, and I think Venamalyana Deepa did also, was that, okay, we have the breathing, but, and, and the breathing itself is a, is a body of breathing. So that means feeling the whole in-breath, the sensations of in-breathing, and then there's a brief pause, and then the sensations of out-breathing, and then there's a brief pause, and then there's another in-breath. So those four phases of the breathing, the in-breath, the pause, the out-breath, and the pause, uh, although the, the Buddha and the instructions didn't mention uh, observing the pause, but if you observe the in-breath, you'll naturally understand and observe that there is a pause 
even if it's just a nanosecond. And then there's the out breath. So the, the pause connects the in breath to the out breath. And uh, so that's the development of the, of the, you know, the breathing awareness, feeling the, the whole breath body and then tranquilizing the, the, the body breathing in, tranquilizing the body breathing out. And so the body, especially when you, in, in terms of the uh, next stages of, this, of the mindfulness of the body, the breathing gets you centered in the body, but then the Buddha has you start feeling the body itself. That means like the, the postures and then the four elements. And you know, when you're sitting, know that you're sitting. When you're st standing, know that you're standing or walking or laying down. Uh, and, and you know it by feeling it, but the mindfulness of the breathing is what gets you centered in the body and develops the initial concentration, ideally to the, to the level of, of access concentration or even the, the first uh, jhana. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the mindfulness of breathing gets you centered in what, what I like to call the breathing body. And then you start feeling the body as the four elements or the 32 parts. So, you know, then you start feeling all these sensations. So what you feel, uh, you know, is the, the various, all these sensations of the, of the body. And so you contemplate, you know, the you know, head hairs, uh, body hairs, uh, skin, teeth, nails, these external aspects of the body, just to see how they're impermanent. And uh, not to say the body is something dirty. Okay, yeah, sure, it, it, it has uh, odors and, you know, it collects a lot of filth and so on. You have to scrub it and, and bathe it. But uh, still, it's not uh, the idea of kind of hating uh, the body. It's just seeing, okay, the body is the body. This is the way it is. But not to get attached to it. Uh, but uh, after... Uh, analyzing the body as just being 32 uh, parts, then the Buddha breaks it down into just four elements. So you're going from a larger whole body, you know, you're aware of sitting, standing, laying down. So you have this idea of the whole body. And actually the contemplation of the body in the body means the, the breathing is a one body, but at the same time, that breathing is occurring within the larger body. So that's the way I interpret the idea of uh, contemplating the body in the body is that the, the breathing body is going on, but it's going on within this larger body. So I, I, I like to just use the phrase, the, the breathing body. Uh, and so that really gets you centered in the, in the body. And the body is considered the laboratory for uh, reaching the mind and the, the laboratory for conducting the, the greatest experiment into uh, the cause of suffering. <clears throat> but the body is, is a strong attachment for people, naturally. And so part of the purpose of the Satipatthana Sutta, mindfulness of the body, is to help people detach from it. So just seeing the body as this utilitarian object, seeing it as the vehicle for the mind and the vehicle for practicing Dhamma. And we create all of our karma through our you know, body and speech, most of it. And so to, and we reach the mind through the body. So when you're centered in the body, you, you also be, start to see your thoughts more clearly. And you have this detachment to this kind of onlooking awareness, like a scientist sitting in the laboratory, saying, oh yeah, yeah, in this body, okay, there's all these head hairs, body hairs, teeth, nails, all these organs are all subject to impermanence. And it's just the body is produced through the past karma. You know, the mother and father provide the material things. Consciousness come from a past life. And it's just work, each life is like uh, the mind working out its karma and it has, it uses the body for that. And that's, that's the way that, you know, 
uh, the Buddha wanted us to uh, develop this insight to the body, not using this body to, you know, to get rich or to get famous or to have power over others and, and so on. So, uh, and so after seeing the body as the 32 parts, all of them are impermanent and subject to breakage and, and malfunction and so on. But it doesn't mean we wanted to hate the body. It means we've got to take care of it so the body functions the way it, it should uh, so that we can also meditate properly. And then he breaks it down into just uh, the four elements. So you're going from a large solid body into now then just 32 different parts. And then you're breaking the parts down into just four elements. And this is one of my favorite uh, in, insightful aspects of developing mindfulness of the body. is just seeing the, uh, the body as these elemental vibrations of uh, solidity, fluidity, temperature, and uh, motion, or earth, fire, water, and air. But I prefer to use the terms, I think it's more illustrative, as just the elemental vibrations rather than elements. When you say four elements and people are thinking about all the, the, the chemistry uh, elements that you read about, iron and you know potassium, magnesium, and all these uh, things, but four elements are not like that. They're the way that the, uh, the life force manifests itself. In other words, even the body, we have the solid body, but the body is made up of just billions of cells. And cells are made up of many, many molecules. And molecules are made up of a certain amount of atoms. And so the amount of atoms that are in a molecule determine its kind of its uh, its uh, qualities, whether it's going to be a, a of a fluid nature, a solid nature, a, a temperature nature, a, 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 a motion, and so on. And what are atoms? Are, are, are electrons, electricity, right? And then, of course, electricity, electrons are broken down into uh, protons and neurons and all these other kind of, you know, invisible things. But I like to see it as just electricity. So actually, the solid body in itself is just energy. Uh, and that's uh, what I think the, the, the deepest aspect of developing mindfulness of the body. Uh, okay, seeing these solid body parts as being impermanent, that's one thing. But uh, actually breaking it down and, and developing the awareness that you're just feeling these amorphous kind of vibrations. So you don't turn these vibrations into, oh, that's my knee, or that's uh, my shoulder. You know, it's just earth vibration. It's just water vibration. It's not me or mine. This is how the Buddha wanted us to develop this mindfulness of the body, to break it down. So it's really very scientific, you could say. And uh, I like to regard the Buddha as being a scientist, a scientist of the body and mind. And this body is the laboratory, and you use the mind as sort of the microscope. And the longer you keep the attention focused in, in the body without letting it get dragged out into the uh, past and the future, then that's how you develop the concentration. And concentration is like turning up the power of a microscope. Right? So the longer you stay focused, uh, and centered in the body without getting distracted by the five hindrances or, or the senses, then it's like you turn up the power of the microscope. So the solid body then becomes just uh, all these different uh, parts and sensations. And then that just becomes just these energy vibrations. And the feeling of the body can also just kind of disappear. And uh, you see how the body is actually just a concept in the mind. Uh, and uh, this just made up of this uh, 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 aggregate of vibrations that the mind then creates perceptions of body parts and, the, and then our body and then this body belongs to me. All that is created within the mind. 
in the later process. Uh, but it starts there in understanding the nature of how this feeling of a body originates. And so that is the deeper level of, of, of wisdom uh, that's uh, you know, developed when you are contemplating the you know, mindfulness of the body. So, uh, you know, it's a gradual process of uh, deconstructing the body from the clinging and infatuation to this external uh, body that uh, is most people's strongest uh, attachment or identification, and also it causes them the most uh, pain and suffering. I mean, some people the whole life, they're plagued by diseases and pains in the, in, in the body and, and so on. And it, it consumes uh, their whole life, uh, you know, for some people. So that's why mindfulness of the body was important, but also for uh, developing that centeredness, because again, the body is the stepping stone for reaching the the mind. So when you're centered in the body, what you naturally feel are the sensations, sensations or even hearing sensations, body sensations, even mind vibrations. You can start seeing them. The, these are the feelings, which will be talked about in the next talk. But you know, the mind getting centered in the body is like sitting in the balcony in a, in a theater. You take a balcony seat in the theater of the body and mind and just watching this body sitting, breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting. And uh, you, you make that as your primary focus of developing uh, concentration. And it's also the connection to the present moment. Because whenever you're remembering what the body is doing, it's doing it in the present moment. So you take that into the into walking and also the other uh, movements. So in the, in the section on clear comprehension, uh, you know, after observing the four postures then in all your different movements, whether you're bending, stretching, uh, going here or there, you're developing these, uh, you know, the clear comprehension of why are we using this body? Why is this body going here? Why is it standing up? Why is it, why is your arm stretching out? Is it going to be something useful or not? So the movements of the body become a, a very powerful uh, extension and continuation of the meditation. It's not something you do just when you're sitting, but the Buddha wanted us to bring us out. And it's that connection to the present moment. That's what's really important because it's the present moment where we're able to really see uh, the, the process of, of the mind going from sensation to perception uh, to volition and then the ego consciousness, which are the five uh, aggregates. Now, also, as we mentioned before, the Venable Jnana Deep also practiced yoga. And he told me when I first met him that he practiced the headstand for 20 minutes uh, every day. And I was also doing that too, as well as other yoga exercises, because uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the uh, meditation happens between the brain and the spinal column. So if you're slouching, uh, the mind will remain kind of in a half drowsy state or just lost in your thoughts. Or if you're slouching also, then you'll get pains in different places. So when you sit straight, then uh, that helps to minimize the, the pain. But gravity is always trying to pull us down, right? We have this big head that weighs maybe five pounds sitting on a small neck vertebrae about that uh, big around. And so gravity is always trying to pull us down. And if we don't have attention to the body, this gravity, you know, gradually pulls us down and we wind up sitting like this without even knowing it. It's because our muscles are weak. We don't practice the exercises that strengthen the muscles of the back and the spine as well as the neck. So in yoga, uh, many of the exercises are designed for strengthening the muscles of the back and the spine and the neck 
and also flexing, getting flexibility in your hips and ankles because that's what is uh, when you're sitting in the cross-legged position, the parts that uh, get the most pain if they're stiff. And so it's the circulation of the body, uh, of the life force to the body that helps keep the mind alert. And so that's one of the primary reasons why uh, also yoga is very helpful in that and why Nirmagnana Deepa practiced yoga and why I, I practiced uh, and still am and uh, have uh, gotten the benefits of, of doing that. Uh, and it helps to get you centered in the body. If you just rush in and you're, you're in a hurry to meditate, and you, you know, you just get out of your car, you run in your house, sit down, you know, try to concentrate your mind on your breathing without doing anything else, you know, you're gonna wind up uh, having a lot of hindrances and uh, it'd be much more difficult to stay concentrated. But if you do some gentle breathing and stretching before you sit to meditate, it's like you're making, you already reached the meditate. You're already meditating while you're doing the yoga. So when you sit to meditate, you're already there for the most part. And then it's just a matter of focusing your attention uh, more directly onto one point, such as the breathing or, or, or begin your expiration because you're already grounded and centered in the body through the yoga practice. So that's one of the uh, main benefits that uh, also and helps why the uh, yoga is useful in uh, learning how to sit comfortably uh, in the body and minimize pain because pain is one of the biggest distractions and sleepiness. The pain and sleepiness are the, the, some of the, the biggest hindrances that disturb beginners. So uh, loosening up the body in that way with the yoga helps to minimize uh, that. Uh, and that's what I try to encourage people to, to work with and also developing deep, slow breathing. But uh, as I mentioned, so the, you know, the mindfulness of the body, at the end of the, the mindfulness of the body, Sutta, of course, after going through the four elements, then the body, the Buddha talks about the cemetery contemplations, whereas you, you see the decomposition of the body and the gradual decay of the body until it just becomes a pile of dust, you know, bone dust. So you've gone from this big solid 150 pound plus body into just a, you know, a couple of handfuls of, of bone powder at the end, which then a uh, strong wind comes by and blows, uh, you know, these uh, bone dust into nothingness, basically. So it's a whole contemplation like that, starting from the gross outer body to gradually getting under the skin to feel the vibration body, which is the four elements. And then, and then also using that as knowing how that all we experience through the senses are, vibra are vibrations. And the sound vibrations coming through the ear and the smell, taste uh, vibrations. And how it's the, the mind that matches up these vibrations with perceptions and then recreates through perception the idea of a, a solid body that's uh, uh, existing in time and space but all that's created in the mind so the uh, the mindfulness of the body uh, sutta sets the whole stage for the rest of the uh, foundations of of mindfulness and, you know, after each of the sections of mindfulness of the body says, uh, okay, there are these four elements just for the, the sake of knowledge and remembrance. And the meditator remains aloof and detached, not clinging to any of these the four elements or anything else in the world. And uh, so it's, you know, and he, he repeats that uh, phrase for all of the, you know, other aspects of the, the Satipatthana too, for feelings, mind states, and, and so on. And so <clears throat> that's why the mindfulness of the body, I see it as a gradual progression. Some people think, oh, you can just practice one or other of the four foundations of mindfulness and, you know, take your pick, you know, and, 
you know, if you try to just go immediately to mindfulness of the Dhamma, which is very deep, without the first developing initial concentration, being able to endure discomforts and uh, uh, gaining uh, ideally the, the strength level of jhanic concentration, then uh, your contemplation of feelings and mind states will be much more difficult because you need that concentration to be able to observe the subtler and subtler vibrations that are going on. And even perception is a mental vibration, seeing the moment the perceptions arise in the mind and how that triggers off the, the reactions. So you have to be very deeply focused uh, uh, to do that. So the mindfulness of the body helps that. And mindfulness of the body sutta is one of the only other suttas, except for the Satipatthana Sutta itself, where the Buddha said this contemplation of the body, if, if developed and made a vehicle of, leads to the deathless state. So the, the, from my recollection of the suttas, it's only those two that the Buddha directly said that directly leads to the deathless, the four foundations of mindfulness and uh, the mindfulness of the, of the body. Because again, the mind's contained within the body. And so uh, by developing mindfulness in the body, you, you basically, you understand the mind also. So, and again, the yoga exercises are what helps you get centered in the body and develop the flexibility of the body and to have a good circulation. And, uh, and also just to, to, to have a better health because health is, a great advantage. The Buddha said having a good health is a, is a blessing. Uh, and if people don't practice the right exercise and, and so on, they're all stiff, and then that's going to be a constant a burden to them. So that's why uh, you know, I deeply appreciate that. And uh, that's why I also you know, encourage, because that's a big problem for meditators. So uh, you know, that's how I've been you know, cultivating the practice. And uh, so I know a lot of other things could be said uh, about it, but uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, set this opening uh, stage and, uh, and I wanted to honor the memory of Venerable uh, Jnana Deepa and his uh, tradition of the exemplary uh, monk's life, the forest monk's life and his uh, his, his use of the suttas for grounding his meditation practice and also he, he encouraged me and when I found out that he was always doing also doing yoga that encouraged me because at the time as a Buddhist monk that I started yoga back in the early 70s very very few or none that I knew of were practicing anything like yoga in fact yoga was seen as a kind of a, a dirty word oh you practice yoga that belongs to Hinduism you know so there's this kind of a negative attitude for Buddhists practicing yoga back in those days. Now, of course, it's much more accepted, but I would appreciate Jnana Deepa how he, he was at the same time doing that and appreciated that. So he, he helped to inspire me in uh, continuing my practice of, of yoga as well as the uh, forest uh, tradition to overcome fears and the fear of dying and the fear of uh, getting hurt. So, you know, even though he, he had these experiences with poisonous snakes and elephants and, and, and so on. He always, he didn't let that uh, fear him. He, he always went back. He never said, oh, I got bit by a snake. I'll never go in the forest again. Oh, an elephant hurt me. I'm never going to go back in the forest. No, he deliberately went right back in to face his fears. And this is what I also highly appreciated about Venable, uh, Jnana Nipa. And even when he was in an advanced old age, uh, you know, he was still going pin to pata as long as he could almost uh, walk. So friends, uh, I know uh, I want to finish up this talk now and I know there's going to be another uh, session shortly. So I want to uh, uh, take a couple of minutes uh, break to use the restroom if you need to. And then uh, as part of this program, we're going to come back and I'm going to lead you through just a couple of the simple breathing and stretching exercises before we sit to meditate. Uh, so I'll hand the program back to uh, Venerable uh, Panya Ramsa. Uh, I'm sorry. So um, 
we will now be going into a break. So we will come back together at 1.55. Mantha will be conducting a meditation for 30 minutes, after which we'll be going into question and answers. So I would like to remind everyone, if you have any questions that you would like Bhante to answer, also keep in mind that Bhante will also be attending the fifth week panel discussion where you could ask uh, questions again from Bhante. Uh, so if you have any questions for Bhante to Day, you are most welcome to put them down on the chat and we will coordinate the questions and uh, coordinate the questions. So I will, we will see you back in three minutes. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm back now. And uh, so we're going to uh, now have a, a few uh, little, some breathing and some simple stretches before we sit to meditate because the uh, hopefully that'll help you to have a, a good uh, body-centered awareness. So you can stand up behind your seat if you have a little, uh, just a little space. Should I turn the camera up? So <clears throat> just try to stand straight. Relax your shoulders and arms at the sides, and just feel your feet pressing the floor. Try to just mentally feel the outline of the standing body and then begin taking a few deep, slow breaths. Try to draw the air from the lower lung up through the middle into the upper part of the chest. Feel that expansion. Hold the air in the lungs two seconds and on the out breath, slowly breathe out, feeling the contraction of the lungs and chest. Let's take a couple more deep, slow breaths to oxygenate the blood, activate the cells of the body with oxygen. And these few simple uh, exercises we're going to do coordinate this deep, slow breathing with the movements. They're quite simple movements. So you can open the eyes and observe on your, me as I lead you through these exercises. So on the next in-breath, raise the arms over the head, interlock the fingers, turn the palms up and straighten the arms and stretch your head back. And look at the back of your hands. On the out breath, turn the palms down and touch the top of your head. We repeat each exercise three times. So again, in breath, palms up, straighten the arms, arch your back a little bit. Out breath, touch the top of the head. Once more, third time, try to hold that upward stretch longer. Feel the sensations. Now release your fingers on the out breath, bring the arms back to the sides and then relax. Close the eyes, try to feel the increased body sensations. The increased pulsation in your fingers and hands. Maybe the clothing touching the skin, just any other body sensations. Just remember the present moment of standing, standing, standing. And then on the, the next in breath, push up on the toes and raise the arms over the head and this way, facing the palms about six inches apart. On the out breath, bring the arms back to the sides, lower the heels back to the floor. Just try to coordinate those movements with the breath. Use the breath to help lift up the body. Drawing the air into the upper chest, out breath. And 
Once more, in breath, stretch. Out breath. Just relax, keep the attention focused in the body, feel the increased body sensations, maybe the heartbeat. Just let go of your thoughts, just let your thoughts come and go in the back of the mind. Just keep the feeling of the breathing body in the front of the awareness. Just remember standing, 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 it's the present moment of the body. Feeling the feet pressing the floor, the arms and hands at the sides, the head balanced on top. Here's one last exercise, the head turning from right to left. So on an in-breath, just turn your head to the right as far as you comfortably can. Look over your right shoulder, turn your eyes to the right. You see something behind you. On the out-breath, turn the head 180 degrees back to the left. To look over the left shoulder, turn the eyes to the left. In-breath, back to the right. Concentrate into the neck vertebrae, imagining them loosening up. Out breath, left. Once more to each side, in breath to the right. Out breath left. On the in breath, let the head stop in the center. Just relax, close the eyes, just feel the whole standing body. Just remember standing, standing. Don't give the mind time to get lost in the thoughts. The body is always here and now. It's the anchor for the consciousness. Just try to feel that organic aliveness of the whole body. Okay, friends, so let's come back to your seat for meditation practice. So friends, uh, we're going to, I'm going to be giving you a guided meditation now. And uh, again, using the body as our uh, sort of central focus. And hopefully having done those few exercises, you might have gotten a, you know, a little bit more feeling in, in the body. And we, we use that. And the purpose of doing the yoga is to help uh, uh, that body connection, that connection to the body in terms of sensations in the present moment to help us uh, anchor you know, in the present moment. So just try to sit straight, you know, kind of get comfortable in your sitting posture. If you're sitting in a chair, try to keep your feet flat on the floor. Just have your hands resting one on top of the other in your lap or your hand resting on your legs. Just gently close the eyes. 
And first of all, just feel the weight of the body pressing the seat. Just feel where the buttocks and the feet press the floor. Just feel that solid contact. That's the earth vibration. Just remember that you're sitting, now you're sitting. Let the awareness kind of move up a bit to feel your hands and fingers. Try to feel your thumbs, try to feel the outline of your thumbs or fingers and the subtle pulsation. Feel the weight of the arms hanging from the shoulders. Just relax the shoulders. Feel where the clothing touches the skin of the shoulders or arms or upper chest. Just the present moment sensation. And just keep remembering, sitting, sitting. Then feel the head balanced on top. Try to keep your chin lifted up level, parallel with the floor. Kind of gently straighten up the back. Kind of imagine you gently lifting up the spine so there's space between the spinal vertebrae so the blood and electrical energy can freely circulate and feel the head balanced on top. Feel some sensations on your face. Imagine the skin of the face stretched over the skull. Feel some sensation. Kind of feel your lips touching together. The upper lip touching the lower lip. Feel the dryness and the moistness. Just the raw sensations. The earth element, the water element, the moisture. And feel the tongue laying in the mouth, the saliva. So the earth vibration, the water vibration. And feel the outer nose. Take a few deep, slow breaths. Try to feel the air moving through the nostrils. Just knowing that thousands of times per day, the life force is silently moving in and out of the nostrils. Keeping this body alive, that we never know it. And just continue the deeper breathing. You just feel the eyes resting in the sockets and the eyelids stretched over the eyeballs. And 
You might see some light or color. You might feel some eye movement. Feel the blood, pulse of blood in the capillaries of your eyes. And from this point behind the eyes, just try to feel the outline of the body. Just let the awareness expand slightly. Feel the general or vague outline of the sitting body. Sensations of the buttocks or feet underneath the arms and hands at the sides. The head balanced on top. Just mentally remember sitting, sitting. It's finding the door of the laboratory. Then begin some, again with some deep, slow breathing to help draw the mind deeper into the body. Try to take two or three seconds to breathe in, expand the lungs, hold the air in the lungs for two seconds to feel the pause, to allow the oxygen to get into the bloodstream and feel the relaxing contraction of the out breath. Just take a few deep, slow breaths like that, feeling the whole breath body, Just the whole in breath and the pause, the whole contracting out breath in the pause, it's cultivating this mindfulness, breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. Breathing in, feeling the body in the body. Breathing out, feeling the body in the body. It's feeling the the breathing within this larger body. With each out breath, allowing the awareness to settle and center in the middle of the breathing body. And then we're going to try counting the breaths from one to ten to and gain a better concentration. With the next expanding in breath, just mentally count to one. Feel the brief pause. The contracting out breath also count to one. The next expanding in breath, count two. Contracting out breath, two. The next in breath, three.
out breath three. In breath four. Out breath four. In breath five. Out breath five. In breath six. Out breath six. In breath seven. Out breath seven. In breath eight. Out breath in. In breath nine. Out breath nine. In breath ten. Out breath ten. Now discontinue the counting. Discontinue any control of breathing. Letting the breath return to its uncontrolled pattern. But continue to feel it. To observe it, you could detach on looking awareness. Just knowing when the breath is coming in and knowing when the breath is going out. You know it by feeling it, feeling the subtle sensations, vibrations. Whether you're feeling the sensation of the air moving through the nostrils at the nose tip, or feeling the expanding and contracting of the lung. And try to notice those four phases of the breathing, the whole in breath, the brief. Pause. The whole out breath in the brief pause. You can just mentally remember this breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting. It's the ongoing continuous connection to the present moment. This breathing body is the natural connection to the present moment. It's breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting, breath by breath, moment by moment.
definition of mindfulness is not forgetting the present moment. Just breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. Just make that the talk of each other. Sustain, continue, focus it, the mind. Just feeling the subtler sensations of the breathing. At the same time, being alert for mental activity, being alert for thoughts trying to sneak up into the mind. Just letting go of the thoughts. Just let the thoughts come and go in the back of the awareness. Just keep the breathing body in the front of the awareness. Feeling the body in the body, the breathing body within the larger body. So even while feeling the breathing, you can notice other sensations coming and going in the body, itchy, scratchy feelings, some aches or pains. Especially with each out breath, just allowing the body and mind to relax more and more into the present moment. Feeling subtler sensations, the vibrations of the four elements, so all the body vibrations, sensations are just the four elemental vibrations that we then identify as body parts, identify the body parts as belonging to my body. It's all created in the mind. Through memory, perception. If you notice any tension in the body, just relax that tension. It's physical tension or mental tension. Tell yourself to relax, relax. Breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. 
Sensations come and go. Perceptions and thoughts come and go. Emotional, physical reactions come and go. Five hindrances come and go. These are all just a continuous stream of impermanence of the body and mind. And just underneath all of that change or mental chaos or pain is the ever-present dimension of now, of the present moment. represented by the breathing. Whatever else may be happening in the body or mind, the breath is always going in and out, and the body is shifting. So breathing in, sit. Breathing out, sitting. If we lose this connection to the breathing body, the present moment, and the mind gets easily dragged under the waves of greed, hatred, and delusion, guilt, worry, fear, anxiety. That connection to the breathing helps to keep the mind afloat. This breathing body is like the life preserver. To the present moment. Just floating with the waves of impermanence without getting dragged underneath. The sounds are heard where you are, it's just hearing, hearing, just hearing vibrations arising and vanishing through the space of breathing body awareness. Just balancing the factors of concentration and mindfulness. The concentration is that continuous connection to the present moment, the breathing body. The mindfulness is the background alertness for hindrances arising or other distractions to be able to let go of them or to apply the appropriate right effort to release that distraction of the hindrances to reconnect recenter in the present moment the flow of impermanence
the mind is centered or clear enough, then just try to identify the five aggregates. This is material form. This is feelings. This is perception. This is mental activity. Urges, ideas. This is the ego consciousness. It's the rising and vanishing. Through the space of present moment awareness. All of these five aggregates, uh, this is not me, not mine, not myself. Simply conditioned phenomenon from the past karma, held together by ignorance and craving. Just try to get the feeling of this body and mind being like an empty house with nobody home, knocking on the doors and windows. There's a sensitive microphone in the house, awareness that knows but yet doesn't know, cannot react. So what perceptions arise in the mind? Dependence on that sound. Sambhi Sankara Anichati Sambhi Sankara Dukkati Sambhi Dhamma Anattati Yada Panyaya Pasati Atene Bindati Dukhi is a magu visu.
all conditioned things, the five aggregates of this body, mind, and world are impermanent. All impermanent things, when clung to with ignorance, bring stress and suffering. And all dhammas, the condition as well as the unconditioned, are without any owner or controller. They're not self. When one understands these three characteristics with the eye of wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. This is the path to purity, to freedom. And thus spoke the Buddha. And now you can place your hands at the edge of the knees. Slowly come out of the meditation, take a deep in breath. On the in breath, stretch your head back, pull the hands against the knees to arch your lower spine. And breathe in, lift the head up, and on an out breath, press the chin to the top of the chest to stretch the neck vertebrae. And lift the chin up level on the in breath. And relax on the out breath. Put a smile on your face. Okay, friends, so uh, I hope you're able to have a, a peaceful or insightful uh, short meditation practice. And now uh, per the schedule, uh, I think we want to open up to uh, see if there's any questions that might have come up based on my uh, the, the talk or the meditation practice. So. Uh, I don't know if there's, it doesn't look like there's any chat. There are some questions, Bhante, which has oh, been okay. And also we are uh, taking questions from Facebook Live as well. So uh, Tina has asked, um, when we do walking meditation, uh, there are so many movements, pain, sound. What is it that we should focus on, she has asked. And how do we keep focus upon one thing while there are so many others objects around as we walk? Well, walking meditation is a combination of both concentration and awareness, which is the same what I mentioned in the meditation practice. So in the walking, we try to uh, focus on the, the steps of our feet. That means the the an impermanence, how the, you lift the foot up and you try to do it slow enough that you feel the foot lifting up. And as a beginning and an end, you swing the foot forward. That's a different movement. You lower the foot to, to the floor is, a, is another movement and command of the mind. And you then you sh the body shifts forward to get ready for the next step. So you try to follow those sequential movements of the foot. You have to do it slow enough uh, that you can feel how each of those is a separate movement and involves a different mental command. To lift the foot is one, to swing it forward is another, to lower the foot to the floor is another, and to shift the, the body forward is another. There's even more than that, but to keep it simple. Uh, and then it just repeats itself. Now, while you're doing that, so that's the focus of your concentration. Uh, to remember that you're walking, but at the same time, you can't avoid uh, sounds coming and going, uh, other sensations on your body and even thoughts in your mind. So just like in sitting meditation, you have to be mindful of that. So you can let go of this uh, 
any potential distractions, the urge to want to look at something or uh, so on, uh, and to always come back. So the walking takes the place of your breathing, basically, uh, or any other movement. If you're standing and then you're going to move your arm, you should do the movement of the arm in the same way. You know, lifting, lifting, stretching, stretching, opening your hand, closing your hand, turning. You try to do each of those. That way you gain impermanence. This is the contemplation of impermanence uh, when you're doing movement of meditation and to seeing how the body mind nama rupa process. You see, the body can't do anything without an intention preceding it in the mind. So, this is the beginning of developing deeper level of wisdom and bringing meditation off the cushion. So many people think meditation is just something you do when you're sitting. But no, that's the, the marvel and the wonder of the Buddhist teaching on this, uh, the practice of body movement and clear comprehension is you bring the meditation off the cushion and you apply it in daily life is where you are making most of your karma while you're doing movements in your daily life. So by practicing it in a, uh, you know, a controlled setting, such as a formal, you'll be able to gradually practice it little by little uh, as your body moves quicker in your daily life. You're aware of that too. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you, Bhante. And thank you, Tina, for the question. Bhante, the other question that we have is um, with the COVID-19 situation and the UK also going into lockdown on Thursday, um, we come to face the challenges of having to develop a meditative spiritual practice whilst also going through the stresses of the time. And a big part of that stress is also being at home, maybe domestic issues and all of these things. How could we, or what advice could we give our participants um, in sort of developing a Vipassana practice with these difficulties, especially arising from family? Well, actually, it's a, it's a you could call it a blessing in, in uh, disguise, because, you know, if there wasn't these uh, restrictions about traveling or lockdowns, people would still, you know, get easily, oh, let's go here and there, do this and that, people inviting you to come here and that. So people find out they don't have much time to meditate. But now, given these lockdowns, and especially as you mentioned, Britain is going into more strict lockdown, you have no excuse why you, you don't have more time to meditate. And then also to increase your mindfulness, if you're with your relatives and your family members more and more, where there's potential for distractions, that's when you have to, you know, don't focus on concentration so much. You got to focus on awareness and watching your reactions to what's going on with your family members and to develop metta, mm -hmm. maitri and compassion and sympathetic joy, the Brahma Viharas, uh, to your family members or anybody else you come into contact with. But the sitting meditation helps to balance that. So actually it should be a, a wonderful time for increasing one's Dhamma practice because you shouldn't really have any excuse, but still the mind will get distracted or will want to watch all reruns on the movies or, or whatever, watch politics, you know, watch the American election and all this stuff that uh, damage your mind. Uh, I heard uh, on the news even that, you know, in Britain, they're betting on the American election and people are spending millions of dollars betting on who's going to win the election. I mean, you know, so, uh, but, so I would encourage people to use this time to, and all the Zoom programs like this one and the Zoom programs that uh, Venerable Panyavamsa is also providing and my own center, we're having every week a couple of, pro so many uh, countless programs that, yeah, you could be watching, listening to Dhamma the whole time if you really wanted to because of the time changes. There's Dhamma programs on the internet, uh, you know, everywhere. So, you know, in that way, I encourage you to make the best of that because when, it, when it's over, then people have all this, oh, then they're going to want to make up for missed time and, and then their meditation will, you know, go out the window almost. Hopefully not, but, you know, you get distracted. So see this as a blessing in disguise, not necessarily as a curse. 
of course, if you have loved ones who are dying, and then that's a, that's another issue. But we can also contemplate death and the reality of the fragility of life, and that you know the four anys. Anything can happen to anybody in any place at any time. You know, get sick, die, uh, anything. So this is the nature. This is the nature of the dumb. Thank you, Bante. If anyone has any questions, they are most welcome to put it down on the chat section and we'll continue to take questions from Facebook as well as the Zoom chats. Uh, Bante, another question that we have is uh, regarding the practice of Venerable Yanadipa. Uh, Venerable Yanadipa was known for his austerity practices. Um, what kind of a prominent place does austerity have in Buddhism? Is it something which is important? Is it something which is sort of recommended uh, in the teachings? Well, I think it was in a Dhammapada verse, the Buddha mentioned that uh, patience is the highest austerity. So that means enduring unpleasant sensations, all the six senses, the inputs, having patience in being able to endure the unpleasant or painful sensations, sounds, smells, taste, whatever is occurring, uh, that's the highest austerity. So uh, when the monks practiced the, the Dutangas back in the, in the day, uh, then they were deliberately, you know, kind of, you know, they were doing it on purpose to endure the pain and deprivation because it strengthens the mind. Mm -hmm. And we're always trying to seek more and more comfort. So mm -hmm. austerities help you to be more content with little and to endure uh, discomfort and know that it's all created in the mind. And we, the, the mind can endure a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort very easily once it's trained. And mm -hmm. so uh, Venerable Nyanadipa didn't see that as a, probably an austerity. He, that's the path, you know, for monks, of course, uh, you know, uh, and that's why monks may choose this life because it provides them that opportunity that they won't get when because the rest of your family and others will won't appreciate you doing that. Uh, you can practice a few, like eating once a day. Of course, it's not a big deal, uh, or you know, not watching shows and TVs. Or, but you know, the other ones were made for monks, the the, the thirteen Dutanga practices. But they for periods of time, you could practice that with some of them, and some people do that, and to get to build a mental strength from that. Thank you, Bante. So we have another question by Leone. Uh, Venerable, you mentioned there are aspect, other aspects to be aware of when walking in meditation, besides the four you mentioned. Please expand to say, what would that be? Well, if you hear a sound and you have the urge to want to look, be aware of that. Notice that, ah, distraction by sound, or just notice the urge, urge to look, urge to look, and to try to let it go of it. Is it really going to be any benefit to look? I mean, maybe it would be if you noticed, you heard your child uh, screaming in the background, okay, then you, you have to use your common sense and maybe look, but it was just, you know, something else. So, or thoughts in your mind. You're starting to question, why am I doing this? Okay, doubts. You, you have to identify the hindrances or any other distractions. So it's, the, it's, it's not different than meditation. It's just applying the satipatthana awareness, vipassana, while you're doing activity, as opposed to just sitting in stillness. So anything, any distraction of the mind is what you look at. But when there's no distraction, you come back and you, you stay uh, with the, the present uh, moment. The present moment is the object of the meditation, not the object so much. The objects are coming and going through the present moment awareness, the lifting, swinging, placing, uh, and other body sensations. But at the same time, you've got thoughts in your mind, you've got sounds, uh, you know, and so on. So, Anything that's taking us away from the present moment, you have to notice that. You have to try to let go of it you know, or apply the appropriate right effort to let go of the unwholesome, to cultivate the wholesome, and then uh, to come back and uh, stay grounded and 
connected to that uh, the present now. Wonderful. Thank you, Bante. And a question that I feel like a lot of people might be having is, Bante, how to correctly practice Dhamma while visiting the grave of a beloved one without being dragged by sadness and sorrow? Uh, well, for one thing, uh, it depends on how the person died, right? So if it's a young person who was murdered or died young, it's, it's much more difficult to accept that. But of mm. course, we have to reflect on karma too. But if it was an older person, like my mother, she died 102 years old. I couldn't feel sad about it. I, I was happy for her because she was released from the prison of her body. So other people that have died at an old age in a gradual death, uh, you reflect on that, that actually remember the joys and happiness that you had with that person. And maybe that'll help you get off your set. You know, most people feel sad about people that, because it's selfish. They're lonely now. They don't have their mother's shoulder to cry on or, or anybody else to comfort. So they're left in their re own resources. And so they feel sad about that, but that's selfish. That person may have wanted to die. My mother wanted to die for the last couple of years. She was 102 years old, but uh, you know, uh, so I, I wasn't sad about it. You know, I was happy that she was released from, from the body. So. Uh, that's why we have to reflect on impermanence when we visit the graves and so on. And uh, we have to remember the, the good qualities of the person, not our own sadness about it. But we have to understand that affection brings uh, suffering. And that's what the, what the Buddha taught. Uh, and to, uh, to know that death is natural and the fact that you're going to be in that grave one day. So, uh, and that the four innies reflect on the four innies, that the, anything can happen, to any, even the young people. You know, young people get killed all the time in accidents and drugs and so many things, unknown diseases, you know, because karma is always lurking there behind us. We don't know what's going to come up and we have to accept it. With relation to that question, Bhante, um, there is shadow integration is a topic that is gaining a lot of popularity within today's spirituality. Um, what part does shadow integration play um, in better processing these feelings of grief, sorrow, sadness, when it comes to specifically losing a person that we love? Uh, well, actually, that's the first time I've heard this term shadow integration. It's the first time I've heard of that, actually. But I, I presume it means, you know, the underlying causes and conditions that we're unaware of, uh, you know, the, the past karmic impressions that we have in us that uh, cause us to react in one way or another when something happens, like the grief and sorrow and sadness. It comes from, again, just the fact of the, the attachment that we have to our loved ones. And it, karma is a very strong power, and especially with families. And we could have gone back many lifetimes in the past, having had the, the same father or mother or brother or sisters and, and so on. Uh, and, uh, or, you know, uh, these strong propensities for people have when they meet people and they immediately might hate somebody or love somebody for no reason. So these might be the shadow reasons why, why we get affected. Know that it's past karma. And uh, there's nothing bad about it, but we just have to understand how these karmas can, you know, be a good ones, or they could be bad ones if they're bad habits. And they, they were holding on to this anger. We don't know why we're angry at a person, but maybe if we knew that we had fought with them in a past life and hadn't forgiven them, then these are this is the shadow that's following us around. And we might have to meet these people again in this life and resolve the issues. That's the whole point. You know, life is about resolving all the issues that we've accumulated, the issues of impermanence, the issues of attachment, the issues of ego. And if we don't learn the lesson, we, we have to repeat it. It's like a schoolroom. Each, each life is like a, 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 a grade in the school, you know? 
And if you don't learn the lessons of the particular grade you flunk, then you got to start, oh, you got to get recycled again. Uh, and so we have to learn the lessons about what are the lessons about greed, attachment, delusion, and uh, all the other uh, things that cause us suffering. And karma is an evolutionary tool. It helps us to, you know, the thing, same thing keeps happening to us over and over. You know, you know there's got to be a reason for this. Other people are not having this. You know, they have different issues. And if we, so we have to learn from that. What is this attachment causing me? What is this suffering telling me, trying to tell me? And we have to learn from it and let go of it. If we don't learn from it, we're going to have to mean it again in the future. That's a very interesting point, Bhante. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question with regards to the practice uh, of uh, the meditation that we spoke today. Uh, I understand for the first time that there are four points in the breathing cycle with the pauses I heard for the first time. I feel a pause after exhalation is where the relaxation happens for me. Yes. How would you explain the pause after the inhalation? Also on a minor on a minor issue, when you stay in one pause, specifically, uh, specifically leg crossed for a long time, how do you deal with the numbness or the pain you feel and continue? Well, I know that the pauses are not directly mentioned uh, in the instructions on Anapanasati, but this is something that a person learns on their own that uh, you know, there are these pauses, even though for a lot of people, the pause is maybe just a microsecond, but usually the mind wanders in the pause. Mm -hmm. And so after the in-breath, it's important not to let the mind then wander, but to feel the pause. And then you'll be there for the beginning of the out-breath. And if you're aware of the, the pause after the out-breath, you have something to focus on. And so the, you can keep the mind constant. If you don't have something to focus on, if you just think it's breathing in and out, what happens during the pause? The mind, you know, it escapes. So that's what I found in my own practice. And especially doing yoga where we, we develop deep, slow breathing and the pauses increase. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the brain and thinking de depends on oxygen. So and when you're holding the breath in, you can't really think. It's such a strong, it's such a strong uh, sensation. And it takes almost all your effort to kind of just to feel that pause with the breath in. And so it's like in your face. And so you can't think of nothing else. And then when you let the breath out, there's no oxygen getting to the brain. So the brain can't think. And you can feel that pause. And the pause can actually get quite long. And that's when you feel the present moment. It's in the pauses where you feel the present moment because there's no object to distract you because the breath isn't moving in or out. And so that's in my own personal practice, that's what I've understood to be the important part about uh, cultivating. And that's the whole breath. That's what's called the whole breath body. The pause is part of the, the breath body. It's the connection between the in and out breath. And by deliberately doing deep, slow breathing, it helps to uh, magnify that and it helps to help you to get centered in that. So I, some people say it's a distraction, but I don't feel it's a distraction at all. Not in the beginning. Later, when you're getting it deeper into like towards the jhana, then letting go of trying to control your breath or do deep breathing is good. But in the beginning, when you still have an active mind, uh, learning how to regulate the breathing especially in a very mellow way, you know, in a, in a very uh, relaxed way, in re reducing your amount of respirations from the normal 10 or 15 respirations a minute down to just uh, three or four or even just two. The mind enters a very deep, uh, you know, you can gain first jhana even doing for the, you know, the, because that's vitaka and vichara is applied and sustained attention to the breathing. So even if you're regulating the breathing, it's still applied and sustained attention. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you. Um, one last question, Bhante, before we uh, have to wrap up the session. Uh, and this is um, about compassion. 
how do you balance compassion for others uh, with compassion for yourself when there is a lot being required of you? Sometimes it's difficult to continue giving when you are tired, stressed, etc. Or there is anger, frustration, or dissatisfaction directed at you. I would be grateful for the advice to help with this. Bhante, I would also like to sort of link this up with the beautiful Dhammapada that you uh, mentioned earlier, uh, that the best austerity is patience. And I would also, saying that, I would like to um, bring up the, um, the scenario between the Buddha and Alavaka Yaka, where there was a uh, where there was an interaction where Alavaka would say, you know, come in, go out, come in, go out to the Buddha. And the Buddha at last he said, no, Alavaka, no more. So there the Buddha sort of, you know, Bhante, he says, no more. I'm not going to take do what you say anymore. Bhante, please. No, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. You know, uh, you know, sure, compassion is a very positive mental state where we, you know, we, we try to help others, but there's a certain limit. And the Buddha, in other instances as well, he said, if you don't find a companion that's equal to you or better, go by yourself mm -hmm. and not to put up with, uh, avoid unwholesome people, you know, uh, avoid uh, bad friends, right? So some people might say, well, that's not compassionate, but, you know, uh, in one sense, we're working on our own liberation, but, and, but at the same time, we know that there's, there's no self, this I is an illusion, but nevertheless, uh, you know, we have to reach a good stable state of, you know, within our own consciousness to be able to help others. So one who helps others helps himself and one who helps themselves helps others. So in the practice of compassion, some people may not want to be helped. We may bend over backwards trying to get somebody to go to, you know, therapy, get somebody to, you know, get off drugs or give them books to read on Dhamma, but they may not be ready to accept it. And at some point we have to say, okay, equanimity. That's what the Brahma Viharas are. The Brahma Viharas are a gradual practice. The first you practice metta because that's the easiest one to practice, just to be friendly to people, right? Not to be angry and so on. But then, you practice compassion. You can't practice compassion without metta, because how can you help somebody else if you're not even friendly toward them? So, uh, and then sympathetic joy is even harder to practice than compassion because sympathetic joy reaches your ego deeper. Oh, how can I be happy at this person getting my job, you know? And so the ego doesn't, you know, like others to win over themselves. And then equanimity at the end, you, you let go of all that. So first of you actively practice metta, compassion, sympathy. And in the end, you let go of all of that and dwell in equanimity. So the same way, you bend over backwards trying to help somebody. If they don't want to listen and they're causing your mind more agitation, at some point you have to say, look, this person has their own karma to work out yeah. and let it go. I know what some people may say that, you know, sounds uh, selfish or, but, uh, you know, you know, each person has got to practice it for how they feel. We, you know, we do what we can, yeah. but we, in the end, we have to understand karma that everybody has. And even if it means letting that person get harmed and, and get their hand in the fire, that's sometimes that's the only way people learn. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, and we, we know we can't really control anybody else, but we try. But at some point, we have to let go and practice equanimity. Thank you so much, Bhante. And thank you for all your efforts in making this session so enlightening to all our participants. And uh, I would also like to thank you on behalf of everyone at the Dhamma Center and all our participants for uh, taking up our invitation and uh, making time for this session. And Bhante was um, very enthusiastic to be a part of the session as respect actually because of Bhante Yana Deepa. Uh, so this whole session, this series on the Satipatthana is wholly dedicated 
uh, to the practice and life of Venerable Jnanadeepa. Um, Venerable Jnanadeepa being such an eminent uh, figure who has motivated so many monks and of course lay people, but specifically monks of the forest tradition in Sri Lanka and beyond has been a motivation for decades to for venerables to practice and live in the forest and to experience that life. Um, and uh, Bante uh, Rahula uh, has a beautiful blog that he has written about his experiences of meeting Venerable Yanadipa. And that is actually why I thought Bante Rahula would be the best person to sort of open up today's uh, session and also speak about his experiences uh, with Bante, um, Bante Yanadipa. So I have put Bhante Rahula's information. Bhante Rahula is also doing courses online, which you can join if you visit Bhante Rahula's uh, website, uh, which is if you would search uh, Lion of Wisdom Center in Maryland, uh, you would find all the details there. You would find all the details there. And the session is going to continue for the coming four Saturdays, the fifth Saturday, we will be having a panel discussion with Bante and also other invited guest speakers. So make sure that you do join. And if you do have any questions, uh, you are most welcome to sort of ask during those sessions as well. We would of course um, uh, suggest that you do have a daily practice of meditation as you go through these weeks, uh, learning and studying the uh, Satipatthana and also to do a bit of reading yourself to better prepare you for the sessions that are to come. If you do wish to be kept in the loop regarding future sessions and programs that we have lined up for you, you can do so by subscribing to Dhamma Center at www.dhammacenter.uk. And thank you very much for everyone who has joined. Bante Rahula, my veneration to you. Thank you so much for making this afternoon such an enlightening afternoon, Bante. Uh, much reverence to you on behalf of everyone who has joined, Bante. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the participants who have made time for the session today. I hope that the session has surely been something beneficial to all of you. Take care and have a good rest of the day.